Hello friends, Cyberry here, and today we've got another Darkest Dungeon How to Use Guide. Um, let's get this shit out of the way first. Remember to hit the like button, uh, share this with a friend, and if you feel like it, visit me on Patreon. Alright, today we are going to take a deep dive into looking at the Eternal class. Uh, the Eternal's canon name, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be mistaken, is Nictoris. Uh, this class was released in August of 2020, and it was last updated in November of 2020. So this is recent and has been semi-recently updated. Um, let's go over the credits real quick before I get started. Uh, the lore and the concept was done by Dr. Heinrich von Freudstein. And the art, the animations, and the sound were done by Von Krolock. Carnifex did the coding and the gameplay, and SASG or SAS did some additional coding. Uh, Brazilian localization was done by Humberto as well. Now I've seen uh, a lot of these names around on other mods, so these are definitely some veteran mods. It's no real uh, surprise that they knew what they were doing when they made this class. Um, I do not have a uh, Resolve level 1 variant of this class, my current roster, so I apologize, these are not going to be the lowest values displayed here, but I'm going to include them because I know them. So we'll start with the base stats. Um, the max HP at Resolve 1 is 18, and it will go all the way up to 30. Um, this is low. This is, um... This is pretty squishy. Uh, it's about antiquarian stats, so you're going to have to protect her or in some way make it so that she is not at risk, which is the default. Um, the dodge here is a 0 at level 1 and a 20 at max resolve. This is a, this is a below average dodge stat. Um, the good news is there's so many other characters with this exact dodge tracking, so it's not terribly hard to equip her with stuff that will um, supplant that dodge, and she also has some options once we get to the combat skills to help out there in that regard. Uh, zero prot, uh, not surprising at all. Uh, most classes have that. Her speed is... Uh, five, six, seven tracking speed. So, at base resolve, she has above average speed, and she's got the same tracking as a highwayman or a houndmaster would. So she should go fairly early in almost every round. Uh, accuracy is a zero. Uh, everybody's got it. Ain't no shame in that. The crit here is actually really high. It's a six two. I believe 10% crit at max resolve. Um, that is tied for the best in the vanilla, in the regular game. So she's tied with the occultist and the grave robber and the shield breaker. She should crit a lot, especially if you go to specific moves in her combat skill pool. And her damage is, it tracks exactly like a backline damage dealer. Uh, the only difference is rather than starting with a damage range at first resolve, with uh, four to seven, I believe, is the normal damage range. She starts with five to eight, so she's a little more reliable uh, damage-wise at low level, but overall, she's a backline damage dealer. She's gonna be doing similar damage than you would see an occultist putting out, um, which is kind of what you expect from a class like this. Alright, let's dive into the combat skills. The first of her combat skills is Channel. It is usable from the 3rd and 4th rank, and it is usable on any enemy rank. It's a ranged attack, with 100 base accuracy at, I apologize, resolve level uh, 3. And it, has, it does full damage, and has crit mod of plus 5. This bypasses stealth, it will increase the torchlight by four, and for for every 25 light in the surroundings, she will do an additional plus 5% damage with this attack. 
So if you happen to use this attack and you are at 100% light, she's going to do an extra 20% damage. Uh, most times, you really don't have enough torches to uh, keep it at 100% every fight. So most times you're going to, let's say, keep it at 75% light. That's at least more reasonable. And that would be an extra 15% bonus damage. So this, you'll see, is her... Um, her single target, it, it's it's her highest priority kill move in her move set. This is this is the uh, bread and butter. Uh, the next skill, Scorch, is usable from any rank, and it can attack any rank on the enemy side. It is a ranged attack with 110 base accuracy, which is a little higher. Uh, the damage mod is minus 60%, but it has a crit mod of 12%. It bypasses stealth and de-stealths the target. It adds 7 to the torchlight of the surroundings, and it will debuff the target. Now, this first debuff, it will remove 7 dodge from them per 25 light. So that could be in a high light situation where it's uh, 76 plus light around you. We're talking about either 21 or 28 dodge removed from the enemy, which is... Pretty intense. That's, that's a lot of dodge to lose in one turn. Uh, and the other debuff is a minus 80% torch decrease skills. So if you're talking about like a, uh, not a courtier, but the uh, the cultist stress dealers, they, uh, they won't be able to reduce the torch by very much at all after one use of this. So this is really handy for keeping the torch lit, and it also add 7 to the current torch value, so it's not a bad attack for that, it's got some utility to it. This move I use a lot. Uh, the third move in her list is Glaring Aegis. Um, it is only usable if you were in the very fourth rank, the very fourth, the very back rank, and it is usable on herself and whoever is in rank 3. Um, it applies one block, one, one Aegis block, to both of them. It will increase the torch value by 12. It has a cooldown of 3 rounds, so you won't be able to use it again for 3 rounds. But it will buff both targets for plus 3 dodge per 25 light. So this will basically, in most situations, give you 9 dodge, 12 dodge if you have 100% light. Um, this basically puts her dodge value at above average instead of below average just by itself. If you can get reliably keep her in the fourth rank and use this, she basically makes up for the fact that her dodge is below average. But I end up using this a lot, especially if uh, whoever's in rank three at the time is like a repost tank or is marked in some way. If they're going to get more targets on them for damage, that block is really helpful. Uh, the fourth ability is her bread and butter healing ability, Rejuvenate. Um, it is usable from rank 2, 3, or 4, and it is usable on any ally, including herself. Uh, Rejuvenate heals the target for 3 points per round, up to 2 rounds. At this level, I believe it might start at uh, a heal of 2? I could be mistaken on that. Um... But if the target is at max HP when this move is selected, they recover 16 stress as well. Uh, this caps out at negative uh, 18 stress, which is pretty beefy. That is a good stress heal. Um, but the situation of the target is at max HP, that's, that's the pivotal point. If you can reasonably get that situation a lot, then she is really useful as a stress healer. Um, so I often find when I pair her with a party, I, I like to pair her with somebody who's got a AoE heal, even if it's not that powerful, that I can just hit every once in a while to keep everybody's health at the top. The fifth combat ability is Wither. It is usable from the first, second, or third rank, and it can target the first, second, or third rank on the enemy side. It's a ranged attack with 100 base accuracy, negative 50 damage mod, and a crit mod of plus 11. So this is going to crit a lot, just like Scorch, um, and it's going to do about half damage. 
it steals all restoration off the target and applies, regardless whether there's restoration there, a four points per round for two rounds heal on herself, and it will debuff the target for negative 80% healing received and negative 80% healing skills. So, uh, you know those Darkest Dungeon assholes that just guard each other and heal themselves and heal each other? Yeah, this this pretty much shuts that down. It's like, you just target one of them, all of a sudden they can't be healed very well, and they can't heal very well. And then you just tear them apart. Um, this move is good in, in the way that uh, Vestal has a similar move. You can get high output out of it. You can do some damage, maybe get a kill, a chip shot on somebody who's low HP on the other side, and you can start regen in the same move. So as long as you're in the ranks usable for this, this is a really, really good move to select in near the end of battles when you can just kill a guy with a few damage. The sixth ability is Eternal Plague. It is usable from either the front two ranks, and it will target every enemy rank. This is a ranged attack with an accuracy base 100 and a damage mod of minus 70%. The crit mod here is negative three. That's pretty standard when we got an AOE move on our hands. Um, but it debuffs the target for negative 15% protection stat. So it'll take, a, you know, especially those fungal guys in the wield, it'll just kind of make them a little more uh, softened up and damageable. And it will apply blight all across the enemy ranks for three points a round for two rounds. It will clear all enemy corpses, and all of this costs four HP damage to your Eternal. So at the cost of some of her life, she can basically chip shot everybody and start some Blight. Uh, this Blight can be supplanted in a few ways, and I'll go over that when we get to the uh, show and tell portion. But it's, a, it's overall a very good move. The, the only problem I find is I have to build a party that will allow her to stay in the front ranks. And that's, uh, when you see how squishy she is, that's a little nerve-wracking. But there are ways to do it, and I think I've got a party that can show that later. Um, her last ability is High Respects. Um, and it's usable from the 2nd, 3rd, or 4th rank. And it, it can target, and does target, all of your allies at once. Um, by default, this doesn't do anything, but it unlocks special abilities for its use with each, each type of canopic jar she has in the inventory. Uh, sh so if you loot with her, she will sometimes pick up canopic jars, and those will, when kept in the inventory, power up her specs, but they're also... Uh, loot items, so each of them is worth, I believe, 750 gold when you uh, turn them in at the end of quest. I could be wrong on the amount there, but the point is, you keep them in your inventory because they're worth a lot. Well, with the first canopic jar, the intestines jar, this move will heal two points. So it'll heal two hit points all across your party. That's not bad. For the lungs canopic jar, it'll heal two stress all across your party. Which is not bad. Now, if you have both of those, that's really good. The liver will cure blight, and the stomach will cure bleed. So you can see that if you have everything, if you have all the jars, this is this move is really powerful. It's not going to do the most um, stress heals per per use, but it will keep them in check. So. I don't know, I find that the only real ones I need to find are the intestines jar and the lungs jar. But if you're in, uh, if you're taking a lot of blight damage, keep that liver jar handy, yada yada. Um, priority wise, I would keep my eye out for the intestines jar and the lungs jar. If you're short on inventory slots, that's realistically all you need. But um, it, it, it never hurts to have them all. 
Like if you can, if you pick up the stomach jar, let's say, well, it may be worth it to throw out the bandages in your inventory to make room for that because it's worth money and because it will make this move heal that bleed anyway. All right, let's go over her roles real quick. Um, she's a healer. She's got multiple options for that. Um, she is a situational stress healer with rejuvenate and horror specs. Uh, she can conserve torchlight and even improve torchlight. She's got loot items, which will and also enable her specs. And she does have a death effect, which I will go a little bit into in a little bit. Um, so, so you can tell that she's got some uses, and she can also do some decent damage if you've got the right moves equipped or if you use the right strategy for your party at hand. Um... So we're going to go into our camping skills now, uh, and then we'll start talking about maybe uh, what to look for in a party for her. The camping skills, she's got generic encourage and the generic pep talk, but other than that, she has five uh, unique camping skills. Clean bandages replaces her wound care. Um, it has the same cost, a time cost two. And on herself, it will remove blight, it will produce bandages to put in your inventory, and it will apply a restore heal of one point for ten rounds on herself. So I find in a combat, a restoration heal is a little riskier. But outside of combat, a restoration heal, especially a long duration restoration heal, is actually more useful. Because if you do get into combat, like, three steps away from where you camped, she's got seven turns where Death Door doesn't mean as much to her. So it's actually going to help her out for longer than just a one-time heal. I like this ability. Um, I don't find I use it very often, just because there are other ways that I prioritize my camping. Curate is her second unique ability. Um... It is a time cost one ability, and it will produce one canopic jar to put in your inventory. You can use this three times per camp. So if you find, um, oh, and the bonus here is I, I believe, I could be mistaken, but I believe each dungeon has their own um, likelihoods to pick up different types of canopic jars, but I believe this move doesn't use those percentages it uses its own so it'll give have the same chance to draw uh the lungs or the intestines so to speak so if you're in the uh cove and the the stomach jar doesn't pop up because i think that's the one that's rare there um you can use curate and one of those three may just be the one you're looking for her third unique ability is entomancy it's a time cost 2 ability, and for each jar in your inventory, it will remove 8% of your nighttime ambush chance. Uh, this isn't the normal way to go about um, stopping nighttime ambush, but I believe normally there's like a 30 or a 35% chance that you get ambushed at night if you do not uh, protect from it. So if you have, uh, let's do some quick math here... Uh, four or five jars then you pretty much don't have much of a chance of being ambushed the chances are very slim so you kind of you can kind of feel how often that's going to be a thing uh, if you have like three jars you have a reasonable chance of being ambushed still but it probably won't happen I don't know I, I personally like this ability it, it the time cost keeps it really usable and if you use curate three times before it well i mean you're probably not going to get ambushed then her fourth unique ability uh, is horus blessing it's a time cost two and it applies buffs to herself it will give you a minus 30 percent torch burn rate for four battles uh, this basically turns the every time you step on the grid torch burn of, I think, six. It will basically drop it down to, I think, somewhere around a four per step, which conserves torches really reasonably. Uh, for four battles, you'll get that. 
uh, for four battles, you will get a plus 30% torch increase skills. So every time she has a torch plus in her skill set, it's going to go up by 30%. And has a negative 30 stress if torch above 75 for the Eternal here. Um, so this is a couple good ways of synergy. It'll keep her stress down, and it'll keep the light up, and you won't have to be burning through those torches to keep it that way. So this is really good if you have the the, uh, the time cost for it at the end of camping. Her final ability is Eternalize. It is a time cost 6 ability that affects the entire party. If there are mortality debuffs, that character will heal 35% of their total HP. This will remove all mortality debuffs and everyone regardless gets a restoration of one point for 20 rounds. Uh, this will keep your party alive for quite a while. 20 rounds gets you through probably at least four fights, I want to say, depending on where they're uh, lined up in the dungeon. So we're talking about three to four, maybe even more combats where you've got a heal coming to you at the beginning of the turn. That's I mean, that makes you not as vulnerable to Blight and Bleed for those times, so I don't know, this is a really good ability. If you if you have the time for it, and you have mortality debuffs on a few of your party members, uh, this is definitely worth a use. Alright, some of her unique traits. Uh, let's get into that death effect I lightly mentioned earlier. Um, what does it do? Uh, if she dies, your party gets plus 100% torch and will regenerate 3 healing for 5 rounds. Um, and it will drop an item called Ka. And the Ka item, if you use that, it will give one character plus 300% resolve experience for one quest. And they will regenerate 1 point over 20 rounds. Uh, that that item is able to be taken back with you to the hamlet and is able to be selected in the provisions menu when you leave on any expedition. So if you have an eternal die on you in a quest, even if you don't have somebody you would want to put that ka item on to increase their resolve XP gain, um, you can take it home with you and then find some resolve level 1 you want to level up to 3 as fast as possible and then bring it with when that person goes out to quest. So it's a very useful item in the situation where she dies, and I don't want that situation to pop up, but shit happens here in Darkest Dungeon. Um, party composition-wise, she has a lot of flexibility. Um, she can, if you're gonna be doing backline stuff with her, then it's probably best to come out with a kit that does so. You'll probably avoid something like this, because you won't be put in the front very often, and this is a uh, maybe case. So, backline probably looks a little bit like this. Perhaps this in the early rounds. Or even, you know, you bring Scorch instead. But, um... If you're using her as a healer, uh, Party-wise, it might be a good idea to um, bring another healer, specifically an AoE small damage healer, uh, you know, like a Vestal or uh, a Mender, that kind of thing, so that you can keep everyone's HP at, at or close to max, so that when she uses Rejuvenate, she can apply that uh, restoration healing, that slow regen healing, as well as a stress heal. Uh, this, that basically takes this move and makes it twice as useful, which is great. So if you can keep your guys at max HP, either through being dodgy and not taking damage, or being quick and dispatching enemies quickly, and having an AoE healer, um, this can be incredibly versatile. Um... Let's see, before we get into the team and going into the mission, uh, let's see, quirks-wise, 
what would I watch out for and lock on her? Well, I lock gifted all the time um, because it boosts the healing received, which will include restoration healing because that is technically not a healing skill as it's empowered. It is a healing received bonus. So when she heals herself, she will heal herself for 20% more. So if she uses Wither, she's not going to heal four points around for two rounds. She's going to heal like five, which is helpful. It all kind of adds up, and it's nice. But in reality, if you want to empower her healing through that method, everyone in your party needs to have this. So it's not uh, easy to enable. But what else would I look out for? I, w I would still lock Hippocratic on her, uh, because... Using Hyro Specs, um, it's still going to be relevant. It really depends on how often you do use Hyro Specs. Um, other things, uh, Fairweather Fighter, I find. I have that on my other one that I'll be showing later. Um, if you get full HP, she'll do an extra 20% damage. Um, I find that is really helpful because you're, tr you're, you're further incentivized to keep her at max HP. Uh, so I find that that does a lot of good and it helps me keep her topped off. Uh, other good ones, Eagle Eye and Unerring are great. Um, as always, with most classes, Luminous and Evasive are really useful. Um, and since she's bringing a lot of light with her, stuff like Photomania and Warrior of Light are uh, really good for her. On Guard is also good, especially if you're using um, Glaring Aegis or something that you want to set up Round one, uh, on guard will help you do that reliably before the enemy can really attack. Um, but let's let's just run into a uh, combat. I think I have a party assembled that should show off her versatility a bit. Um, I don't typically use her as a frontline, um, like blight spreader. I use her in the back a lot, so usually I'll have a completely different uh, combat skill situation. But uh, we're going to show off a little bit of how busted she can be if you have the right trinkets in that kind of a role. <laughs> and the right trinkets is, is not necessarily uh, the most objective thing in the world to look at but uh, for her the right trinkets in this case are what increases eternal plague uh, so I've got one of her um, trinkets here that'll increase the blight skill chance and the blight amount by 30% but it'll also give her 30% more damage received from the ability so instead of taking at max here, 5 HP damage, she's going to take more like 6 or 7. Uh, so it's not bad, and it will increase the damage by a few. I believe it only increases from 4 to 5 or a 6. And then I also have my custom trinket for the Virid class I'm working on, Ashra's Head, that will increase that Blight damage by 3 again, and also increase her accuracy. So we'll find that Eternal Plague in this run is going to do work for us. The smell of rotting fish is almost unbearable. All right, let's do this. Let's try and get uh, man, running a little late on this guide anyway. But let's let's try and get three battles in. I will come back to this treasure. It's not like I'm not going to finish this quest after I'm done recording. Hey, there's a battle. We got two in a row coming up. All right. Get the torch light up in normal values here. So this party is going to benefit from blight being spread on the enemy party. Uh, so the shield breaker is going to start it off. The grave robber is going to shadow fade into the back. 
and both of the attack moves I can use from this rank are going to do bonus damage versus Blighted. And that is just going to tear people apart in one shot. But more importantly, uh, because of how much power I've put into this Eternal Plague boost, it applied Blight to both of them. We got a 10 Blight. So, Blight-wise, we're covered. Uh, this is one of the few people I would run with her as a healer, because it can also protect her and activates her post on herself. Plus, she, uh, she's not an AoE healer like I would recommend to travel with the Eternal, but she's versatile enough that she's going to be able to make up for that. And then a kill? Nope, not quite. Yes, she's dead anyway. Okay, so let's, um... Do stress values at 2 and 6, we're good. Wither didn't get a kill either, oh man. That's okay. Because that... The regen heal of 6 is going to help me considerably. Hey! We've got the intestines canopic jar. So now, uh, Harrow Specs will heal HP when we do it. Nice and handy. Alright, let's do this again. Battle number two. So see that blight that I've powered up is insane because two of that blight came from the shield breaker and the other, I believe, eight came from uh, my eternal. Let me just make sure that two comes from this. Yeah, no one. Wow. Wow. So we got nine blight coming from the Eternals, um, the Eternal Plague. Well, let's do it again. Let's make sure these guys don't see the sunlight ever again. Bye, guys. Slowly, gently. This is how a life is oh, you don't have to die? Oh, man, come on. Hang around a while. Ah, oh, damn it. This expedition at least promises success. We don't need that. We don't have a class that's really utilizing it right now. Let's do this anyway. Why not? The darkness holds much worse than mere trick. I know I'm gonna be coming back, but the question is whether the dungeon will let me later come back adequately to grab all this shit. Hey, do we have any of that? I do. I have a couple. All right, let's get rid of Unquiet Mind. Now, Unquiet Mind isn't a terrible negative quirk to have. It just means you're not going to be able to meditate for stress relief. But there are so many other options that, depending on the character that's on, it, it's not a, it's not inhabit, inhabiting, no, it's inhibiting you. <laughs> In any way. Alright. Third fight, here we come. The twisted faces of Single the target. Alright, this changes things a little bit. Um, we're gonna wait on the Eternal Plague for him to do some uh, collect calling. So we're gonna use Wither, do a little chip damage. Still blight him because of those trinkets. Well, one of those trinkets. And then we're going to stack some damage on. Alright. Let's uh let's set up a regen. I believe it does a small regen, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can... Oh, let me do this one then. He's blighted, it'll do bonus damage. Oh! So broken. You're dead, Mr. Collector. You didn't even know you were dead, but you are. As the ghoulish collection scatters, the rats forbid. See, I didn't even get in, get to the turn 
where she got to set up the plague there. I was waiting, I was waiting until it was more targets, but it didn't happen. So you'll find that she has a lot of versatile ways to be used. Um, I, di I didn't show off Glaring Aegis, but I, I would really recommend if you're going to use her um, as a support unit and a healer that you come with something that looks a little bit like this, or this, or even this, and set her in those back two ranks, uh, preferably the fourth in that situation. But that's really all the time I've got for a deep dive into the Eternal. So a uh, quick reminder, check me out on Patreon or whatnot if you're interested, but uh, you know, share this with a friend, drop a like. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. Stay frosty.